the spirit of truth will bear witness to me says the lord and you also are witnesses good morning people of god this is the reverend dr chris mcmullen retired priest in charge of the parish of the upper kennebecasis in beautiful kings county new brunswick with our weekly video service for the week of sunday june the 21st 2020 now we are having a service on this Sunday at 9.30 a.m. at the Church of St. Simon in St. Jude, but this is for those who um, cannot or prefer not to attend church yet in public, and it's also for those who do and yet want to have a prayer service during the week. And so uh, my sermon and my scriptures are not the same as what we'll be doing Sunday morning, but will be appropriate for whenever uh, those who want to worship by video this week can join us. So may God bless us and keep us as we worship him together. The liturgy is primarily from our Canadian Book of Alternative Services, with some sections from a service of the word, which was published as a supplement to the BAS in 2001. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, that you have again brought us together to praise you for your goodness and to ask for your blessings. Give us grace to see your hand in the week that is past and your purpose in all the week that is to come. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Born of the water, born of the spirit, sons of the wind and daughters of fire. Sealed with God's promise, we shall inherit more than the most we ever desire. One through redemption, one with the Father, children of grace and children of heaven, joyfully sharing faith with each other, sinners whose sins are ever forgiven. Glory, all oh glory, glory to Jesus, die we in him, and in him we live. Friends for his service, heirs to his treasures, God and God only ever can give. Born of the water, born of the spirit, sons of the wind and daughters of fire. Glory to Jesus and to the Father and to the Spirit, our sanctifier. Those well, words were written by Michael Perry in 1982, adapted a bit by myself to uh, the tune Bun of Sun, Morning Has Broken. Uh, we used it many a time in the baptism service. Let us remember before God our selfish ways, the things we have done wrong, the sorrows we have caused, the love we have not shown. This prayer is on page 691 of the Book of Alternative Services. Most merciful Father, forgive us our sins against you and against each other. Strengthen us to overcome our weaknesses, that we may live in love as you would have us live, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. This comes from the prayer book 
for Australia in 1999. Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us and showing the way of salvation through faith in your Son. We ask you now to teach and encourage us through your word, so that we may be ready to serve you for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first lesson on Old Testament reading is the one assigned for last Sunday in the continuous Old Testament lessons in the Revised Common Lectionary for a proper 12 of Year A. It continues the story of Abraham. I'm reading from Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 to 21. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. Sarah and Abraham's child Isaac grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on that day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of her slave Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit along with my son, Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him. Also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in his skin had gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. And she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot, where she said, Do not let me look on the death of my child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, and I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy. And he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm that's assigned to pray after that reading, and it's a good psalm for that reading, is Psalm 86. Uh, this is found on page 819 in the Book of Alternative Services. I'm going to read verses 1 to 10 and conclude with 16 and 17, and of course, the psalm prayer. Bow down your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and in misery. Keep watch over my life, for I am faithful. Save your servant who puts his trust in you. Be merciful to me, O God, for you are my God. I call upon you all the day long. Gladden the soul of your servant. For to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving. And great is your love toward all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Attend to the voice of my supplication. 
in the time of my trouble, I will call upon you, for you will answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, O Lord, nor anything like your works. All nations you have made will come and worship you, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you are great. You do wondrous things, and you alone are God. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Give your strength to your servant. Save the child of your handmaid. Show me a sign of your favor, so that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed. Because of you, O Lord, you have helped me and comforted me. Let us pray. God of mercy, fill us with the love of your name and help us so to proclaim you before the world that all peoples may celebrate your glory revealed in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I've chosen our New Testament lesson myself uh, that uh, reflects upon our Old Testament reading, a rather peculiar reading, and I can't say at first um, reading St. Paul's thoughts on this help either, but I'll be speaking about it. This is from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians, chapter 4, verse 19, through to chapter 5, verse 1. My little children, for whom I am again in the pain of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, I wish I were present with you now and could change my tone, for I am so perplexed about you. Tell me, you who desire now to be subject to the law, will you not listen to the law? For there it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and the other by a free woman. One, the child of the slave, was born according to the flesh. The other, the child of the free woman, was born through the promise. Now this is an allegory. These women are two covenants. One woman, in fact, is Hagar from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the other woman corresponds to the Jerusalem above, for Sarah is free and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, you childless one, you who bear no children. Burst into song and shout, you who endure no birth pangs. For the children of the desolate woman are more numerous than the children of the one who is married. That's quoting Isaiah 54. Now you, my friends, are children of the promise, like Isaac. But just as at that time the child who was born according to the flesh persecuted the child who was born according to the spirit, so it is now also. But what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave and her child, for the child of the slave will not share the inheritance with the child of the free woman. So then, my friends, we are children not of the slave, but of the free woman. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This hymn comes from William Cowper. He died in 1800. He came to mind this week because he was a great worker for the abolition of the slave trade and wrote a very influential, controversial poem written from the eyes of an African um, speaking about the injustice of slavery 
and the condemnation that this brings upon uh, the English people who participated in the slave trade. Uh, he was an associate of John Newton, that great ex-slave ship captain, who became very anti-slave trade and, of course, became a great Christian uh, preacher, an Anglican priest, and wrote Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. And uh, he wrote many hymns, uh, several are still sung now, and this one has always been especially beautiful to me. He wrote this in 1773. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps on the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unsearchable minds of never failing skill. He treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take, the clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, and trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err, and scan God's work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. So Sarah said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit long with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son, but God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. And then we can hear Hagar's prayer in the psalm, couldn't we? Bow down your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and in misery. All nations you have made will come and worship you, O Lord, and glorify your name. Turn to me and have mercy upon me. Give strength to your servant and save the child of your handmaid. And then from uh, Galatians, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a slave woman, the other by a free woman. The child of the slave was born according to the flesh. The older, the child of the free woman, was born through the promise. Now you, my friends, are children of the promise, like Isaac. For freedom Christ has set us free there. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. We need a bit of background for um, both our lessons. Last week we heard on the earlier part of Genesis chapter 21, where God promised a son to Abraham through Sarah. And Sarah laughed and named Isaac for her laughter at the thought that she, an old woman, after all those years, would finally bear Abraham a son, the son that God had promised. But before that, in chapter 20, 19 maybe, I just forget, 20, um, Sarah and Abraham are getting anxious. They have no one to be an heir of their great estate as they traveled the Holy Land as, as nomads. 
uh, in obedience to God's promise to make of Sarah and Abraham's family a great nation. And Sarah gets impatient, like we all get impatient with the Lord. And she said, here, take my slave, Hagar, and have a son through Hagar. And then we will have a son to look after all of our hired hands and our flocks and uh, look after us in her old age. And Abraham, perhaps all too willingly, goes along with this. You see, we don't have to be perfect to be used of God. We don't have to be saints yet. God will use us anyway, even our stupidity, even our unfaithfulness, even our sin. Not that we should be encouraged in that. But forgiveness means the past is past, but we can be better for the future. So, well, it's it back in chapter 16 that Sarah had a solution. The Old Testament is so realistic about people. And now Sarah is jealous of Hagar and the older baby boy. He's the older son, so he came first. You know, that's, he should be inheriting everything. Women didn't count in those days. And so she wants Abraham to send Sarah off. And Abraham, again, maybe a bit all too willingly, sends her off into the wilderness. And Hagar, when she runs out of water, she places her son under a bush. She can't even watch him die of thirst. And she walks away, sits down, looks back at the bush, and prays. And God answers her and assures her that Ishmael as well will be the father of a great family. You know, the Arabs, the Arab peoples, consider themselves descendants of Ishmael. And this is spoken of. Ishmael is considered the firstborn of Abraham and the heir of God's promise in the Quran for the Muslim people. And it's funny how things work out. It really is. What I think we can learn from this is that there are no outsiders to God's blessing. And this is something Paul picks up in a big way. We'll get to that in a minute. There are no outsiders to God's blessing. You know, people may seem to have all the benefits. You know, and they may seem to have the strong faith, and they may seem to have everything go right with them. But there are no outsiders to God's blessing. God has a plan and a purpose. And though we know God's blessing through Jesus Christ, we know God by name through Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have the New Testament. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the sacraments. We have the scriptures. We have the call to a holy life. This is magnificent. And we should treasure this and share this with as many as we can. But we have no right to look down on those. Everybody, do you think God is not at work in all the of the world, one or another? Maybe as an unknown stranger, as an anonymous friend, but God is at work. And people can learn to pay attention to that. And that's part of our job as witnesses. So Sarah, in frustration, forces Abraham to make a decision, and he does, but God writes straight and crooked lines. So the two things I want to say here. First is there are no outsiders, but second, God writes straight on crooked lines. There's no excuse for sinning. Our epistle lesson that we read on Sunday morning, June 21st, is from Romans chapter 6, and it starts off, well, if God will keep forgiving us and God's mercy abounds, why do we keep on sinning? And Paul says, God forgive it. Don't you know that you're born anew to a living hope? To the resurrection, you've been claimed that by your baptism. You can't possibly be disloyal to God's promise and God's goodness. So our motivation is not, you know, you got to get good with God and obey all the law. Our motivation is, thank you, God. We love you, God. It's so wonderful to be God's children different kind of motivation and Paul's going to get at that in our reading from the Galatians too. So God saves Hagar because God writes straight and crooked lines and there are no outsiders to God's blessing. So the third point is that the Lord hears our prayers. The Lord hears our prayers. They may not be answered in the way we expect. But God will send an angel 
His Holy Spirit will comfort us and give us strength and wisdom, and we will be able to carry on to the right time when God, the Lord, hears our prayers. Now, in my experience, there are two kinds of people that uh, go through rough times and come out of it the other end. Who are victims of their circumstances, you know, and have had to make hard decisions. First, there are those who, after they have gotten through it, turn in judgmentalism towards their mates and their peers. Well, I did it, so what's wrong with you? I must be better than you. And you probably deserve what's happening to you because I escaped it. And what's your problem? And I've seen this again and again with a poor person who became wealthy, with someone who overcame sickness and then turned on others because they didn't have the same. Attending AA meetings, I've seen it. And then there's the people that have been through hard times and have experienced God's deliverance and then they were never there but for the grace of God went I. And they turn back to help others with compassion and empathy and sympathy. When I worked at First United Church in Vancouver, there were two social workers on staff who were both reformed alcoholics who had made it off the street, off Skid Row, and now were working as social workers. And they had such empathy and such compassion, and they had such believability and integrity with the uh, street dwellers of uh, downtown Vancouver because they had been there and they turned back in compassion. But us, of course, never looked back and went on ahead and perhaps became judgmental towards those. The gospel reading we heard on Sunday, June 21st, ends, sorry, last Sunday, June 14th, you receive without payment, now give without payment. There are no outsiders to God's plan. And that's my final point, is there are no outsiders to God's plan. It's about the future and not the past. Go back to Paul's epistle to the Galatians. Some back Christians of a pagan background, some Gentile Christians, had decided to become very fanatic Jews. To really be a child of God, to really be a follower of Jesus, to really be saved, you've got to get circumcised if you're a man, and you've got to live up to all the Jewish law. And Paul, who's been going all around the ancient Roman Empire, preaching the grace and goodness of God, you just have to believe in Jesus and be baptized and you will receive the Spirit. And life is about love and joy and hope. Based on that faith, he's, he's at his wit's end. My little children for whom I again in the pain of childbirth until Christ is found in you. I talked about how this image of, of childbirth is often applied to salvation into the new age that is to come, including the violence, the pain that that uh, leads to that. And so Paul say, I just feel that way about you. You've got it so wrong. You're turning into the kind of religion of a Pharisee that I had before Jesus converted me on the road to Damascus. It's about grace, not keeping all kinds of laws. It's about love, not judgmentalism. It's about faith in the Lord, not arrogance about your own accomplishments. And he's at his wit's end, so he takes the story of Ishmael and Isaac, of Hagar and Sarah, and turns it around. Now, I can't defend the way the rabbis use the scriptures in Paul's day in allegorical ways. Uh, I'm not interested in defending that here. It is hard to understand. I'm simply trying to get through all that to Paul's point. And he's playing a trick here. He's being very ironic. And he's saying those that want to become Jews by circumcision are slaves 
in the tradition of Ishmael. They're Hagar's children. They're slaves. Now, the Jews are descended from Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the 12 sons of Jacob, and so on. But, but, but Paul twists it around and says, no, the people who want to become, uh, live by all the Old Testament laws and live that kind of religion of judgmentalism and negativity, they're Hagar's children. But remember, Ishmael was born because Sarah and Abraham cooked up a deal to try to cheat God and try to get ahead on it on their own and out of their own manipulations and schemes come up with something. And that's not going to get you salvation from the gracious God. But Isaac was a child of promise. Sarah couldn't even believe it. She laughed so much. Abraham couldn't believe it. And here they were in their 80s or 90s. I forget. I think they're in their 90s. And then Sarah becomes pregnant with this child of God's promise. I remember one of my Old Testament professors saying, there's not a hero in the Old Testament whose birth was under, uh, was not under unusual circumstances. It was, it was like a difficult childbirth. It was a sign, you know, that God wanted this child to be born and had a future for it. Now, today, childbirth is relatively easily, at least that's what us men say about it, isn't it? But you can imagine those days, I mean, a lot of time the mother didn't even survive the childbirth. And yet here was his child, Isaac, blessed with promise. And, says Abraham, you pagans, you outsiders, by your faith in Jesus and your reception of his spirit, you, through Isaac, you are like Isaac, children of God's promise. Again and again, our Christianity can become more like the religion that put Jesus on the cross, I'm afraid, than the religion that Jesus went to the cross to release and bring into the world, the religion of grace and hope and patience. Too often, even our Christianity has become a religion of judgmentalism and negativity and accomplishment. Well, I'm living a good, honest, middle-class life, and I have great pension plans, and God has been good to me, and there's a reason for it. Rubbish. <laughs> There, but for the grace of God goes me. And what can we do to help others? So it's not about the past. We're children of promise. It's about the future. And Paul insists on this with his people. Okay? For freedom, Christ has set us free. Freedom that the future is guaranteed for us and we can face the days with courage and confidence, with forgiveness and patience, with wisdom. Determination, stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. There are no outsiders to God's blessings. God writes straight on crooked lines. That's an old Polish proverb, by the way. The Lord hears our prayers, and it's not about the past, it's about the future. Thanks be to God. Page 52 of the Book of Alternative Services shall we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I think I told you this once before. This is one of the first uh, Christian folk songs I learned uh, in the mid 70s uh, when I became a follower of Jesus. It was written by Kurt Kaiser in 1969. It only takes a spark to get a fire going and soon all those around can warm up to its glowing. That's how it is with God's love. 
Once you've experienced it, you'll spread his love to everyone. You'll want to pass it on. What a wondrous time is spring, when all the trees are budding. The birds begin to sing, the flowers start their blooming. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you'll spread his love to everyone you want to pass it on. I wish for you, my friend, this happiness that I found. You can depend on him. It matters not where you're bound. I'll shout it from the mountain tops. I want my world to know the Lord of love has come to me. I want to pass it on. I'll shout it from the mountain tops. I want my world to know. I want to sing. It's fresh like spring. I want to pass it on. Our intercessions will be guided from the uh, litany in uh, the 2001 publication of the Anglican Church of Canada, uh, Service of the Word. Let us join in prayer with God's faithful people throughout the world, saying, God of love, hear our prayer. We pray for the unity of your church, that our life as a parish, as whatever what circle of Christian love we belong to, whatever what tradition, that our life may reflect the love you have shown us. God of love, hear our prayer. We ask your grace for David, our bishop, recently elected Archbishop of the province of Canada, and for all ministers, pastors, and priests, for all who minister in word and action in the mission of the church, that all Christian leaders may bear faithful witness to your good news. God of love, hear our prayer. We seek your peace and justice in our world, O oh Lord, in race relationships, that all discrimination may end. We pray for those victimized by war and violence. Pray for all who are victims, uh, health-wise, economically, spirit and mental health-wise of the present COVID-19 pandemic. We pray for our country and our communities that the needy may never be forgotten God of love, hear our prayer. More personally, we ask your blessing on our homes, our circles of friends, our family. And we pray also for those who live alone, especially in this time of isolation, that we may know your presence ever near us. God of love, hear our prayer. We name before you all whom you have given us to pray for especially people in our own circles of love. We name them in our hearts at this time. Knowing that you are doing for them better things than we can ask or imagine. Knowing that you are calling us to be witnesses to that fact, to our own love and good cheer and kindness. God of love, hear our prayer. We commend you all who have died or all who are grieving people that they have lost, especially the families of the tens of thousands of victims of COVID-19. That our trust in you may deepen as you keep our loved ones safe and you heal broken hearts in your care. God of love, hear our prayer. 
Honey, we offer our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. Rejoicing in the knowledge that you are always with us. God of love, hear our prayer. We look for your purposes to be accomplished in us. We ask you to fill us with the strength and vision of your Holy Spirit to further your reign. God of love, hear our prayer. The bottom of page 129 in the book of Alternative Services, this lovely prayer of thanksgiving to conclude. Accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life and the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends and for the loving care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you for setting us tasks which demand our best efforts and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying through which he overcame death, for his rising to life again, in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your Spirit, that we may know Christ, and make him known, and through him at all times and all places give thanks to you in all things. Amen. And our collect for this week, proper 12, the um, third Sunday after Pentecost. O God, our Defender, storms rage about us and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair. Deliver your sons and daughters from fear. And preserve us from all unbelief through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, our one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Now this coming Sunday, June the 28th, we will be having a service of communion, a drive-in service, as we enjoyed on June the 14th at the Appahawk Recreation Center. If weather is inclement, uh, folks in my parish will get a phone call and an email. Uh, we'll move it indoors and have a service in Bell Isle at the church. Um, but it will be an Apoc on the 21st, God willing, uh, drive-in uh, service, as we had uh, last week. This is to the um, Celtic tune St. Columba. And it's a tune, a hymn written in 2005 by June Boyce Tillman. Embrace the universe with love and shine with God in splendor. Embrace the earth, embrace the sky, and find God your defender. Find wisdom hidden in the stars and faith within the rainbow. Find righteousness in flowing streams and hope in moon and meadow. Embrace your friend, embrace your foe, and find the Christ within them. Embrace your body and your mind, these also are God-given. For mercy dwells in human hearts, and needs our love to shape it. Put out a hand and touch a heart, and help to consecrate it. Share all you have with all you meet, 
and find your strength in scripture prepare your heart prepare your mind and leave to god your future so even death when joy is deep can be christ's benediction creator god we sing your praise as pilgrims seek your vision may the god of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing that we may abound in hope rejoicing in the power of God's Holy Spirit. See you next week, and God be with you.